right in. We are in the book of Exodus, um, and we are so excited. We are going to finally um, meet God in this story. Uh, so we are excited for today. We are looking at the idea of rescue and restoration as we talk about the book of Exodus. Uh, we're looking at how God no, not only gets his people out of slavery, but gets slavery out of God's people. Uh, last week, Russin talked about how God heard the cries of his people and is moved with compassion and righteous anger for them. We saw how God heard, he saw, he remembered, and he knew of the suffering of his people and how he wants us to also care about the physical needs of people as we move to address spiritual needs as well. And today, we're going to see this first encounter that Moses has with God and how he invites Moses into a mission of rescue and restoration. So allow me to pray over our time, and then we will be in Exodus chapter 3. God, we thank you for your story um, and how you help us to see ourselves in the story as well, that we are like Moses, not the great hero, but the desperate searching person. Uh, we pray that as we read through the story that we will see you more clearly, that it will be your words that stick with us and not my own. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we are in Exodus chapter 3. We are going to jump right into verse 1. Okay? So uh, as a reminder, Moses has uh, fled Egypt. Uh, he killed a man, is running away. He finds uh, Jethro and the Midianites is what Sam talked about a couple weeks ago, and he has been hiding out there learning to be a shepherd. So chapter 3, verse 1 starts. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So you know anything about me, I love symbolism and digging into those minute uh, moments. So there's some really cool symbolism here uh, when we talk about the cardinal directions. Uh, and often the east uh, was the point where this, well, not often, always, the sun ri rises in the east, uh, and it's mentioned often in Scripture uh, in several places, but specifically that the Garden of Eden was placed in the east in Genesis 2.8. And then after sin, Adam and Eve left to the east. Cain, after killing his brother, flees to the east. And so there is this idea that eastward is the movement of the human story, of humanity, that everybody is moving eastward. And remember, this time in Moses' life, he's running away, out of the story of Egypt. And so which way is he moving? He's not going east. He's going west, right, to the wilderness, He's out, in this, he's out of the palace, and he's now in the pasture among the shepherds. He's probably thought his life was over. And for 40 years, he lived this life of a pastoralist. We get this detail uh, in Acts 7.30 where it says, Now when 40 years had passed, and an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. So for 40 years, I think that boggled my mind when I read that. It's not just that he's run away and he's hiding out, and then God sends him back. For 40 years, he has been a shepherd. We talked about last week about how sometimes seasons of suffering can feel like they're never going to end. And I wonder if Moses felt this way, like this is just my life now, right? All this stuff, stuff I thought I was going to do is over, that this, life, this is now my time of punishment and pain and shame, and that's where I'm going to stay. And talking with you all and praying with you guys over the past couple weeks, I know many of us in this congregation feel this way, of being stuck in a place of hurt and of difficulty. But hear this, that God's delay does not mean God's denial. I'll say that again. God's delay does not mean God's denial. Without knowing it, Moses is actually moving closer to God, away from humanity's story. And while the East symbolized the movement of humanity, the West often symbolized access to God. There's an idea of going back to the Garden of Eden. Abraham left Canaan and went West, following God's promise to be with him. Um, later in Israel's history, the temple in Jerusalem was designed to face East, but the priests always accessed it from the Western side of the temple. Even kind of accidentally, we were talking about this this morning, uh, is that east is that way and west, wait, no, it's the other way, Sam, right? One way. 
West is that way, and east is this way. So you uh, exit going to the east of our church, and you enter the church coming in from the western side. Uh, that's unintentional symbolism. But uh, anyway, the point is, he un- Moses unintentionally is going west seeking a new life. That Moses spends years being a shepherd, but all this time he is moving closer to God. That God is using this time to get the slavery out of Moses. First by training him how to lead sheep in preparation for leading his people. The phrase here for keeping the flock can be translated as pasturing the flock, which I think better points to this idea of learning to be a pastor. Being a shepherd requires so much patience in dealing with animals that are stubborn and prone to their own destruction. And Moses gets a lot of training before being the shepherd of God's people. As an elder team, we're reading a book called The Care of Souls, Cultivating a Pastor's Heart. And one of the ideas that stuck with me is that being a pastor combines the science of theology and the art of pastoral care, that you need both. The head knowledge is not enough. You need practical experience in empathy and being with people, which is the true training of being a shepherd of God's people. Also, we see that Moses just happens to go to Mount Horeb, which is also called Mount Sinai. And this place will become known as the mountain of God later on. Because not only does Moses meet here with God many times, but another spiritual leader named Elijah will also meet God here as well. In all of these small little ways that seem like coincidence, God is moving and preparing Israel's rescuer, even though it seems like he's not actively seeking God. When you reflect on your life and the moments and the choices that brought you to where you are, are you able to see how God has been working behind the scenes? I know in my life, when I've taken the time to look back on how God worked, it brings me to be in awe and worship Him. Franklin County was not a place that was on our radar that we were trying to be. Young Life was not the place or ministry we thought we'd be involved in. Bedrock Church was not the place we were looking to serve and find community when we moved here. But God moves through people and circumstances and did that to bring Holly and I to where we are today. And we're so grateful for it. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. We get another Genesis picture here like we've been talking about each week. When describing the bush, the writer uses a specific phrase that it was not consumed, which would hyperlink in your brain, if, if you, we translate it a little bit differently, it helps, that it was not eaten up as a reference to the Garden of Eden. While the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil was eaten up by Adam and Eve, we now have a bush that has God's presence in it that is not being eaten up because he is there with them. This living fire does not eat up the bush. God is often connected to the image of fire throughout Israel's history, even several times within Exodus. When God makes a covenant with the patriarch Abraham, God appears as a smoking pot and a blazing torch. And I think God does this, he gives us this picture of what he's like, because fire is so hard for us to wrap our heads around. I think we have a picture of fire, I don't know if that's been up there or not. There you go. (laughs) Set the tone. Uh, Uh... But yeah, fire is a hard thing for us to wrap our heads around. It's not a solid, liquid, or a gas. It gets its own category. Uh, It moves almost as if it's alive in these unpredictable ways. Uh, As Sam and I were talking, and like it's a hard thing to calculate mathematically the movement of fire, and I I can't explain that, but that's the best I can do. Um, That it's, it's so undescribable to us that it has all these abilities to bring warmth and comfort and good things, but it can also bring destruction as well. It's good, but it doesn't mean that it's safe. And so I think God likes to describe himself that way. When we first moved to Florida from Virginia, I'm sorry, when we first moved from Florida to Virginia, uh, we were not used to the challenging uh, things about changing of seasons. Uh, Florida has two seasons, and so we were not used to that. Uh, We never had to rake leaves before. And so the first fall when my family moved to Amherst County, we had leaves and sticks all over our property, and so my brother and I were tasked to rake all the leaves up and collect the fallen branches into one giant pile. And uh, this pile was, with no exaggeration, probably 10 feet tall. Uh, It was taller than all of us. Uh, And it was in our gravel driveway next to our house. And um, my father figured out that the best way to dispose of it would be to burn it, which is true. 
But if you know anything about burning leaves, you do it in a ditch and you do small amounts at a time, not this pyre uh, that we had created. And so um, that we poured lighter fluid on it and we <laughs> lit it on fire. Uh, and uh, we had this 10-foot effigy to autumn just blazing. <laughs> Uh, and it was so hot that it was melting the side of our house. And so we uh, had to put this thing out and, and learn from our mistakes. But, um, you know, we, we put out our, our burning bush, if you will. But it, it demonstrates the powerful, uncontrollable nature of fire that we think we can be masters over, that we so quickly dismiss uh, and miss the true power of it. The other thing that's startling here in this story is that it says this flame was the angel of the Lord. But notice something else, that this being then says, I am God, later on. And that God tells Moses, no man can see me and live. And there's no swap that takes place here between the angel and I am, or Yahweh, later on. And so what historians, theologians, archaeologists, people say that this phrase, angel of the Lord, is God, but in a way that they didn't yet understand, because it is Jesus, just not in human flesh yet. This is what theologians call a Christophany, or an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. And we see this again in Daniel 3, in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Sheep. Wow, that's a lot of words. Start over. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, when King Nebuchadnezzar throws them into a fiery furnace that they are not eaten up by the flame, but there is a fourth human shape among the fire that is protecting them. Another example of this is in Judges 2, uh, verses 1 through 2, where it says, Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Right? So Moses, the rescuer, has an encounter with the future rescuer, Jesus, and he doesn't even know it. Verse 3, and Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned or not consumed. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. The Lord gives Moses an invitation to come meet him, and he accepts. Moses first notices something different and wants to know more. It's only when God saw that he turned aside to see that he then calls out to him. I think there's something important for us to notice here about God's character, that he wants human partners, yes, but he's not going to force them to join. They have to be curious about who God is to start with. When we look at the people that followed Jesus, tax collectors and fishermen and political rebels, they were broken and messy, but they also wanted to be well. They were looking for something more, and so they're ready to drop everything and follow Jesus. I know as the church, sometimes we can feel this pressure that we have to witness and save the most rebellious, far-gone people that want nothing to do with the gospel. But maybe our role is just to open up curiosity and let God do the rest, because that's all he needs. All it takes is a little humility to want to know more, and God can work with that. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God gives the growth. He can work with the smallest amount. With Moses' initial curiosity piqued, God says his name multiple times, so there's no mistake who he is talking to. And Moses responds with, here I am, identifying himself and declaring his readiness. And the same phrase will be used in the story of God calling to Abraham and God in a vision to Jacob. And when the prophet Samuel first encountered God, they hear his voice and they say, here I am. So what about you? Are you willing to say, here I am? Have you uh, been feeling the nudging of God to encounter him in a new way? Going off the path can be scary. 
There may be a burning bush there. <laughs> but are you willing to trust your story to God's story? And so we want to pause here for a little bit. Um, at Bedrock, we like to have a little bit of discussion where we can interact with each other a little bit. Um, and so we are going to just break into some groups just where you're sitting, kind of move into some circles. Um, and we're going to discuss uh, some things uh, today. So here are the discussion questions. What are areas where you have felt God inviting you into something new? And in what ways have you answered, here I am, to God asking you to join him? Or maybe, what are the effects on us if we say no to the here I am? In the back, we're going to have some discussions for our kids. Um, Letitia's going to lead that today. Um, and the questions are, how do we learn what God wants us to do? How do we show other people that we're following Jesus? And what happens if we choose not to do what God asks us to do? Okay? And then we'll end our kids' time with a challenge. Choose one of the things that you talk about in your group today to show others that you're a follower of Jesus. So let's go ahead and break into some groups, and let's talk about this. All right, um, we are going to jump back in. Um, I always uh, encourage you to ask your kids what you talk about in discussion because it's always fascinating. That's one of my favorite things. Uh, it seemed like they were having lots of good stuff back there. So. Um, okay, so let's keep going. So Moses says, here I am. We are now in verse 5. Uh, then God speaks. All right, verse 5. Then he said, do not come near. He just said, here I am, right? He says, calls his name. Moses says, here I am. And God says, stay right there. Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. This is only the second use of the word holy in the Bible. The first time is when God creates the Sabbath on the seventh day and declares it holy. A time is called holy, and now a piece of ground is called holy. So what is this concept of holy ground? It is something set apart and distinct for God's purpose. God choosing to reveal himself in that place made the ground holy, and it's recognized by the human partner. And the same thing will happen later to Joshua before the battle of Jericho. He also has an encounter with God in human form, and there is a similar response here. Um, so in Joshua chapter 5, 13 to 15, it says, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? And I love the answer. He said, no, <laughs> but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And look at the reaction. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, Why does, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, look at the phrase, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Being on holy ground means it is set apart for God's purposes. And it means that person is also being called to be set apart for God's purpose. We as Christians are given the same calling in 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. It says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. We are set apart, distinct from the world, meant for God's purposes. Are we living like that? Do we have a sense of mission and purpose in our daily life that stands out from the things the world says to chase after? Can people tell by the way you talk and act you're different in the best way possible? God is mighty and overwhelmingly great. Shouldn't we want the world to see that? And yet God gives protection to Moses here who doesn't know enough about God's power to know what he can handle. He tells him to remove his sandals and helps him to understand the gravity of the place he is and who he is talking to. God gives Moses an invitation into something big, but there are going to have to be protective barriers as well for his flourishing. In other words, something extraordinary is going to happen when we partner with God, but it's going to cost us our comfort. And then God makes introductions. Verse 6. 
And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. God gives Moses a recap of his history, showing that he has always been there. He says, I am, not I was, showing his eternal personal presence. Moses is not going to be bringing a new God to Israel, but reminding them of the one who has always been there. And we see Moses' reaction is the fear of God. A few weeks ago in our sermon, in our life groups, we talked about the fear of God. I was talking with Sam again. He told me that in their life group, they talked about how the fear of God is described as a blessing uh, and a treasure in the Psalms versus the fear of man being more of a negative thing. And the fear of God is how we respond to God because we trust in his goodness, despite not understanding the breadth of his power. Verse 7, and then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. We talked about this last week, that he is El Roy and El Shema, the God who sees and the God who hears. And he knows their suffering. God doesn't just see, hear, know, and remember the suffering of his people and keep it to himself. He acts by making Moses aware of how he feels about the pain of his people, hoping that Moses will feel the same way, that there's empathy here, and that he'll partner in God's plan of rescue and restoration. In a way, God gives some vulnerability to Moses, showing his heart to this man. Verse 8, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. This seeing, hearing, knowing, and remembering God leads into action. We talked about last week that remembering is more about recommitting to a promise or covenant that was previously made and deciding that now is the time. God isn't passive or uncaring. He has a plan. We see the promise here of a better life outside of slavery, a land flowing with milk and honey, which is not a literal description. As Veggie Tales tells us, it sounds sticky. Um, but a, it's a sign of fertility for animals having lots of babies and producing milk, and plants that produce lots more plants because of the pollination of the bees producing honey. There's also a promise here of victory over enemies that are in this land that God will show the world who he is, not just through domestic prosperity of his people, but he will speak the language of these other nations that only understand violence and that allowing them um, to defeat these other nations through military combat, to show them that their God is more powerful than their gods, that there will be restoration to the life they were meant to have, an Eden picture of a garden that's full of abundance and safety. Verse 9, And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. It's still an invitation, not a command, that God gives to Moses. It's so relational and casual how God tells Moses, come on, let's get started, right? It just sounds so simple. All right, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh, and you're going to bring him out of Egypt, right? But as we will see next week, Moses is not quite ready to jump in and get on board with God's plan of rescue and restoration. He's got to get the slavery still out of his heart. And so, what are some takeaways from this week that we can focus on and apply to our lives as we think through this passage? I got a couple points. Number one, God always has been, always is, and always will be. When we feel like God is absent, I promise you that he's not. He may be there in ways we cannot yet understand, but he is working for our good and the restoration of his people. And if we truly want to understand this, We have to know it not just in our heads, but in our hearts. The more we spend time in God's word, the more we will see his involvement in the great story of rescue and redemption. He's everywhere. 
And likewise, the more we spend time in investing in demonstrating God to other people, we will see his fingerprints in their lives and in our own. So tell your story to other believers and ask for their story in return. Fill your heart with the continual confirmed goodness of God showing up and working through people that partner with him. Number two, God's delay does not mean God's denial. He may be preparing you for a great task or challenge that you have no idea is coming. And we need to start viewing these seasons of being in the desert as seasons of preparation for what God is going to do next. But we are also not meant to do this alone. Be a person of encouragement to other believers who are in those seasons of deserts, waiting for God to show himself. Number three, I think the third takeaway we can see from this story is that God wants human partners, but it's always an invitation, not a command. God is consistently offering us a chance to embrace a sense of purpose and mission, but we have to choose him. I love the phrase that um, Holly has used, and we've used it all the time, that God is an, an opportunity broker, right? He's presenting an opportunity for us. Are we willing to say, yes, here I am? How can we make steps this week to open our eyes and hearts to the bigger picture of bringing rescue and restoration to our community by saying yes to the opportunities that God presents to us? And maybe you think you can't because you're too tired or you're too busy, but here's the truth. We are all busy and we are all tired. You just get to choose what you're tired from and what you're busy doing. What could be more worthy of our time and our energy than saying yes to the thing that God asks us to do? Number four, we are called to be holy, set apart for God's purpose and plan. If we say yes to God's invitation, it's going to cost us. It'll cost us our comfort and the way we're used to living. We'll have to give up th things and the mindsets that we're enslaved to, but we'll also have to give up good things that can't be the main priority anymore. God's mission requires exchanging our ways for his, being set apart, distinct from the rest of the world. And so this week, where do you need to make changes to better represent God to the world? Pray this week for wisdom and discernment of how to be set apart for God's great plan of rescue and restoration. So, we're going to close our time with one more song. That we, as we focus in on this God that lives in the burning bush, that is Jesus to Moses, um, let's sing together about how deep God's love is for us.